a question asked by the prophet Zechariah in his book in chapter 4 verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? The honest answer is just about everybody. Think about that question a minute. We are a generation of bigger and better. Gotta have a bigger, better car. <laughs> Some folks really do. Gotta have a bigger, better house. Gotta have more money in the bank. Churches have gotten caught up in that. Gotta have a bigger congregation. Gotta have a bigger building. For who hath despised the day of small things? Maybe there is no verse in the Bible that shows what the Isaiah the prophet said that God says, my ways are not your ways and your ways are not my ways. My ways are higher than the heavens than your ways. Isaiah 28, 10, let me read it to you. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now the particular reference there is to the teaching of the Word of God. And you, you learn the Word of God a word or two, a line or two at a time, and you work at it your whole life. But the spiritual application here is to everything and everybody. Uh, there are some folks who really need more than what they have. But I suggest most of us have all we need. The world says, don't sweat the small stuff. You've heard that all your life. God says, do. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine, is what Jesus said. It's never one great big crash that ruins your life. It's a little one here and there and again and again and again. God says, do be concerned with the small things in your life. Maybe the greatest illustration of the world when Jesus was sitting on a chair by the temple treasury watching everybody put their money in and this little and, and, and it says a lot of put a lot of money in and here comes this poor little widow puts in two pennies two pennies <clears throat> and Jesus said that little lady gave more than everybody put together because she gave everything she had I think that the churches of our nation today could use an attitude adjustment on this subject. Our good sermon is supposed to be a good outline preached from the heart. You got to have a little of both. If you preach just totally the outline, it's better than a doornail. If you, if all you do is pull out your heart, it may not make a lot of sense to a lot of people. I have a feeling that I may drift a little to the heart side today. So, if after a while I really get excited and start to really preach, y'all just sit there and relax, okay? I won't bite. I've never been known to spit to the second pew. So y'all just, if you want to kick your shoes off and relax, y'all go right ahead. Because this is a subject that is dear to my heart. I am tired of seeing 
small churches criticized by big churches. I am tired of poor people being treated like second-hand citizens in churches. I am tired of going to preachers' meetings, which I hardly ever do anymore. I am tired of going to preachers' meetings where the pastors of the big churches look down their nose at the pastors of the little churches. I am tired of the big preachers mocking the little ones who don't have any money. I'd be one of those little guys. Who hath despised the day of small things? First of all, let me give you the circumstances around this verse. The nation of Israel, God took them out of Egypt, led them for hundreds of years, gave them Canaan. They prospered and became a mighty nation. David, the king, did that. And then his son Solomon got to be the third king who reigned for 40 years during his administration. He built a temple, a magnificent temple. You would never have seen so much gold and silver and purple and ivory and marble of every color like you would not believe. And that's what they worshipped in. Well, of course, you know what happened in time. They got, got fat and sassy. And they forgot God. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to try to get them to come back, and they wouldn't. So finally, God said, okay. You're going into Babylonian captivity, and in 586 B.C. that happened. And the city of Jerusalem, where this magnificent temple was, and the king's house, which was just as much so. Babylonian came in, yanked the wall down around the city, burned out all the houses down, just literally plundered that rich temple and burned it down. And the nation went into captivity for 70 years. Well, after 70 years by God's design, see, there's a time and a season for everything. Cyrus the Persian released the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. Best guesstimates, and it is just that, that only about 40,000 people max ever returned back. Most of them preferred to stay in Babylon where they now had built houses and had good jobs and were making a good living and they didn't want to go back to Jerusalem because they had to completely rebuild. But some who had a heart for God did. And one of the things they rebuilt was the temple. Well, the temple was rebuilt with volunteer labor and donated material. So get a picture. Here is Solomon's temple. That magnificent, beautiful, ornate structure. And here's a place to worship built by volunteer help and donated material. At the dedication of this one. In Ezra chapter 3, verse number 12 and 13, I'll just tell you what it says. It says that the dedication of the temple, there were three responses. Some rejoiced, some wept, and some mocked. Because of the inferiority of this temple here. Some rejoiced. By the way, you've got the same class of people in every church today. There are people who are rejoicing over what they've got. There are people that are weeping because like the old men, they remember the original temple and all our church used to be full. And we used to have all this money. Boo-hoo! And then there are those who mock. I take particular offense at those who mock. How dare anybody mock a church of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't matter how big it is, how small it is, how rich it is, how poor it is. Doesn't matter what part of town it is or anything else. It is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now let me answer a question that I have. Why would anybody mock or despise a church and God's people? Why would anybody come and knows that the work of God at any level anywhere? I wrote down some things. Number one, people who do that are just out of fellowship with God. Nobody who's right with God is going to look down the nose at another church. Number two, they're ignorant of God's Word. They're ignorant of God's Word. They just don't know what a church really is. Most people have the idea a church is a nice building and a nice program. Hey, this building, this nice building, by the way, this is just where we meet, you and I. We're the church. We're in the people business. Ignorant of God's word. Thirdly, they're rebellious against the Holy Spirit. Oh, boy. I've had people tell me through the years why they won't come to a certain church. Businessman, I have to join a big church because it would be good for my business. That's not a good reason to join a church. Politicians go to the biggest church in town because they need votes. That's not a good reason to go to a church. You're supposed to go to a church where God tells you to go to church. Amen? Amen. Rebellious against the Holy Spirit. Number four, out of fellowship with each other. Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Out of fellowship with each other. Some people are in a church and they get it upset at somebody else in the church and they just go to another church. You know when you do that you're taking your problem with you to, to another church. God says you get out of sorts with somebody, go sit down with them, work it out. That's what Christians do. For who has despised the day of small things? You know the whole purpose of the book of Philippians is that Paul wrote from prison. Paul in prison wrote the book of Philippians to a church that's, that's being persecuted and they're trying to run it out of town. And Paul writes when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. The book of Philippians teaches Christians rejoice not because of what's going on out there, but because of what's going on in here. When the inside's right, the outside will be right. Do you realize all over the world today, most churches that are meeting today are meeting in, under trees, in woods, in barred facilities, in schoolhouses, in cellars because it's illegal, having to guard to make sure the police isn't coming to break it up? Folks, we're blessed. Mightily. Mightily blessed. Talking about the materialism of this age, Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Small things. So what does the text teach us today? Number one, despising and kicking against the work of God at any level is kicking against the providence of God. We don't always have to like where we are in life, though we really should, but what matters is that we accept where we are in life from the hand of God. Your lot in life, your possessions, your difficulties are ordained by God. Your good times are ordained by God. Romans 11 36. For of Him, through Him, to Him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God is as much at work in the day of small things as in great times. The God who orchestrated the building of that magnificent temple was the same God that orchestrated the rebuilt temple. God put it in the heart of Cyrus to let him go back. God put
put it in Nehemiah's heart to get a crew together and go rebuild it. God put it in the heart of the, of the Persians to supply the building material. God was as much at work in that and God is just as much in a work equally as one that has 10,000 people this morning and one that's got 20 or 10 or 15 this morning. God is sovereign. He knows where 10,000 are needed. He knows where 25 are needed. Let me tell you something. 85, this is a fact, 85% of the churches in America today are less are congregations of less than 50 people. Preachers, congregations, you'll never hear from. They're born, they live, they die, they go to be with the Lord. These preachers usually have to work a job and do the best they can with their churches, but they preach the truth. And this is what's keeping America from plunging into hell in the judgment of God. That's the truth. That's the reality. And that's usually where the power of God is. Because folks like that realize they need the Lord. You don't despise God's work at any level. God said, don't do that. Then we need to learn, secondly, from this text, there are going to be many days of small things. Not every day is a big day. Not every paycheck is a big check. Not every house is a big house. Not everybody's going to be healthy all the time. Not everybody can drive a new car. Not every meal is going to be steak and baked potato. There are going to be many days of small things. The, my, I have heard Dr. Crystal say at First Baptist of Dallas, because he's gone to the Lord now. Huh? I've heard Chuck Swindoll up at Frisco, Texas uh, say, I have heard that J. Vernon McGee, who's been gone for what, almost 30 years now. Huh? I've heard three of the, the, the men that pastors of the biggest churches in America say this. The worst thing that ever came out of the churches of America was the spirit of competition. Amen. Folks, it doesn't matter what they're doing over here or over there. God is here with you. And that ought to be good enough. Here's some good verses. Proverbs 23.4. Let me read you two or three good verses. Proverbs 23.4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Now there's another verse. That's the opposite of what the world says. The world says you've got to accumulate. You've got to be rich. World, God says don't do it. Now, if you've got a job and you get rich, do it. That's great. But if you don't, don't let somebody intimidate you because you don't have what they have. Let me tell you something. Which much, with much stuff comes much grief. Just enjoy what you have. Then I want you to look at Job 5.7. Job 5, 7. Man that is born, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. You're going to have lots of days of trouble. By the way, you can thank your great granddaddy Adam for that one. Ecclesiastes 11, 8. But if a man live many years and, grow, and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness. For they shall be many. There are even preachers of the Pope of America telling you you're supposed to be rich, you're supposed to be prosperous, you're supposed to be 
healthy. He spoke to everything the way he wanted. Ladies and gentlemen, I know this is not going to be very popular, but that's a lie. That is not what the Bible says. Yes, if you work hard and if you if you're frugal and if you do right, yes, you'll accumulate, and that's good. But don't let people intimidate you and browbeat you. I like the song that Bill Anderson sang many years ago at Nashville. We got a young man from Nashville here today. God must have loved poor people because He sure made a bunch of them. <laughs> Remember that song? Amen. Yes, I was in Bill Anderson. Sorry, but not spiritual enough. <clears throat> I guess I'm not. I don't know. There will be many days of small things. Let's learn another lesson. Small days on life. The very nature of the text and in the setting of the text tell us small days don't last. I remember as a young preacher and we were poor. Somebody said, enjoy the emptiness. Well, at that time I didn't understand what they meant. Wanted enough furniture to fill the house. Enjoy the emptiness. Church was, my first pastor of church was, uh, I just built a nice 400 seat auditorium and my first Sunday there, there were 25. And somebody reminded me, enjoy the emptiness, because with more fullness come more problems. Enjoy it where you are. First of all, yesterday's gone. What are you do about it? Tomorrow, you don't have tomorrow until it gets you. So what do you have today? So what are you going to do? Moan and groan and carry on and woe is us? No. Enjoy the day that God has made. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Amen. I like these boys. They're going to be my amen cheering section here. <laughs> Small days don't last. Proverbs, Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Tough times don't last. Tough people do. First of all, Israel's day, the best day they get to come. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's through the tough times. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the good time. Bad times don't last. Let's learn another lesson. Living the Christian life and doing Christian service requires faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What God honors is your faith. God doesn't care about my ability to preach or lack thereof. God doesn't care from 30 or 90. I'm somewhere in there. That's close enough to tell me can help. God, God is glad we have this building, but ultimately, that's not his priority. That may be ours, but it's not his. Without faith, it's impossible to please Faith. God honors faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Abraham counted him faithful who had promised. 2 Corinthians 5 7. We walk by faith. Not by sight. See, we don't go by what we see. We go by what God says. If you, if you get your eyes off your circumstances personally, if you get your eyes off your circumstances as a church, you'll, you'll get a much brighter picture. I can honestly say that God has never failed one of you yet. God has never forsaken one of you yet. You come out, you say, how do you know that? Well, that's easy. You're here. You don't look up 
to be up to me. You don't look too hungry to me. Your clothes look pretty good to me. You walk by faith, and God will do new miracles. Now let me say this. God's done some wonderful things with small things. Sir. God took a 300,000 man army and whittled them down to 300 to go against an army of a million. Humanly speaking, sure suicide, but with God, one, and God is the majority. God fed 5,000 men plus women and children safely to say 20,000 with a little boy's sack lunch. Moses had a rod and God used it. The widow had just enough oil left for one more meal, and God made it last. If you've never read a book called George Mueller of Bristol, you ought to read it. George Mueller lived in the late 1800s. He raised over 10,000 orphans he, in his orphanages around London and England. He printed millions upon millions of tracts and never one time in his 92 years of life asked one fellow human being for a dime. He asked God and God supplied it. Elijah fed by ravens. God has done some wonderful things with small things. God will do some wonderful things with you if you walk with Him by faith. And then let me say one more thing and make this a pretty practical application. We need to learn to be content with what we have and where we are. Because we need to learn to look beyond human hands to the divine hand of God that guides the human hand. You don't have to know how much money you have coming in here for the next year. Now, that's nice. It's okay if you can do it. If you don't, hey, God only promised you today. You don't need any money for next Sunday because not, not next Sunday you don't need it. He's, he's, he's applied the money today, and if we're still here next Sunday, he'll supply the money next Sunday. God has supplied the people. God has supplied the preaching. This is God's church. We're just stewards. We're just caregivers. And if, and if for a while the church has to live one Sunday at a time, so what? If it's one sermon at a time, so what? God will always be here. And that's the main thing. Having food and raiment, let us live with <coughs> content. Paul said, I've learned how to be content. I've learned how to have plenty. I've learned how to do without. I've learned to have a lot of food. I've learned not to have enough food. I have learned to be healthy. I've learned what it's like to be sick. And through it all, he said, I'm content. Churches today and Christians today need to fight the spirit of discontentment. It is an insult to a holy God who loves us and cares for us. I'm going to close with something that Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, verse number 24. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Live where you are. Live where God's put you. 
live on what God is supplying and enabling you to work for. As a church, keep your eyes on the Lord. Be grateful for what you have. Because the truth of the matter is, we all have enough. We all have enough. I want to say to anybody here that has never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that is a very important, most important need of your life. There's nothing I've said means anything until you become a born-again Christian and you submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and experience the forgiveness of your sins and yield yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is number one paramount. And once that's done, I like Psalms 139. And even there shall thine hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold. There'll never be a day, there'll never be an hour, there'll never be a minute, there'll never be a second in your life after you're saved, but that the Lord will lead you and take care of you individually and as a church. Would you stand, please? Never get by, never have to We're going to have a song. Let's come and do this next song. If you need to be saved, this is an invitation. If you'll come forward, I'll pray with you. If you'll look us up after church, I'm not going to leave in a hurry like I did last week. Uh, we'll talk to you. Maybe somebody here, you, you need a good church home. Every Christian needs a church family to fellowship with and be with and, and a place where you're taught the Word of God. This is where God wants you. You come by salvation, by statement, by transfer of the letter, by baptism. If I've touched on some need in your life, standing right where you are, you can just pray and say, Lord, I commit this to you. What do you want? I'm going to pray with you. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to sing, Our Heavenly Father, have your perfect will and way in every heart, in mind, and life, for the good of your sheep and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.